Morning, everybody. How you doing? It's Brad here again. I'll start off by talking a little bit about me. I guess that's what I do a lot, but maybe it's useful. I'm not a uh, a confrontational person by nature. I've been watching a lot of videos by other YouTubers to try to get an idea what you know what flies on YouTube and what doesn't. And I notice that a lot of them are confrontational in your face sort of people. And their whole shtick is just trying to get people fired up and then they say, here, make a comment about it below and then they'll argue with you and, and, and you know, hilarity ensues. I am conflict averse. This is probably true for a lot of us who get into Zen. Uh, we're not really, I mean, think about it. You're, you're spending huge amounts of your life, my hair's having a conflict with me. You're spending huge amounts of your life uh, in a room, uh, often by yourself, often surrounded by others, but always in silence, uh, not uh, not in a kind of in-your-face discussion kind of thing. So, um, means means I, I don't have a, a, an easy time with it. But I've been thinking more and more about uh, what it is we're actually doing in this Zen project. And I don't think it's quite what people imagine it to be. Recently I posted an article up on Facebook and then left. Uh, I, I'm not interacting on Facebook right now. I'll put things up, articles that I think might be interesting, and share my own pieces of writing so people know that they exist. But I'm not looking at the comments, I'm not reading them, I'm not responding to them, obviously, because I'm not reading them. Uh, I'm just kind of letting it go. I'm not moderating, I'm not deleting, I'm not doing anything. Every time I do jump on for a minute or two, uh, I, uh, it looks like a horror show in there to me, and, and I don't want to be part of it. But uh, talking about this current uh, political stuff that's going on, I posted this article that appeared on Tricycle by Ken McLeod, and it is called A Crooked Tree in Changing Times. He says this, What is a Buddhist response? Some see a Buddhist response as the taking of some kind of political or social action, engaged Buddhism. For these people, Buddhism is a religion. Many centers have now established participants and teachers who function in ways that are similar to the congregations, priests, ministers, or rabbis in Christianity and Judaism. While the resources in these Buddhist congregations are not on the same order of those in Christianity or Judaism, they are probably sufficient to exercise serious influence. However, there are dangers in such an approach. As management thinker Peter Drucker points out in Post-Capitalist Society, and I'm going to read the quote, Very few strategies have ever been as successful as that of the American Protestant churches when, around 1900, they focused their tremendous resources on the social needs of a rapidly industrializing urban society. The doctrine of social Christianity was a major reason the churches in America did not become marginal as the churches in Europe did. Yet social action is not the mission of a Christian church, that is, to save souls. Because social Christianity was so successful, the churches, especially since World War II, have dedicated themselves more and more wholeheartedly to social causes. Ultimately, liberal Protestantism used the trappings of Christianity to further social reform and to promote actual social legislation. Churches became social agencies, they became politicized, and as a result, they rapidly lost cohesion, appeal, and members. I'm not really interested in gaining members for uh, my congregation. I don't even think of, of what I, I do as having a congregation, nor do I think of myself as a member of clergy. I've written about this before, and people get upset uh, by that, but I don't, I don't think of myself as a member of clergy. I am a guy who does zazen, and I've done it long enough that I can teach other people how to do it, but I don't see it as my role to lead a congregation who are going to effect social change. I'd like to read a little bit more of Ken McLeod's article. My own training was more about how to use whatever circumstances we encounter as a way of waking up in our lives. I was never taught that the practice of Buddhism was about making the world a better place. It has always been about coming to and giving expression to a different relationship with life, essentially a mystical path. This is important. This is, a, this is not a path of social engagement. Uh, you know, you can do whatever you want. So I'm not saying, 
you're bad if you're socially engaged and you're a Buddhist. But my view of it isn't about social engagement. It's a kind of personal engagement. However, the personal engagement is also a kind of social engagement. And this is the part that is very difficult to really get across, especially to people who haven't engaged in this before. And I know most of my audience either hasn't engaged in this process before, or they've only engaged in it for a little while and they haven't really gotten deeply into it. What happens when you get deeply into Buddhist practice is that you find that your journey to the center of yourself is actually a journey into the center of the self of everyone. Because we have similarities that go much, much, much deeper than any of our differences. And what we tend to do in politics and normal social engagement on Facebook and all these other things we generally uh, get into, or most people get into, uh, we're, we're dealing on a very, very superficial level. We're just right on the top of things. And on the top of things, everything seems very, very different and, and has all these features and, and differences and things. When you go down deeper, you find that there's a whole well of things that are exactly the same. It's not just you and me who are exactly the same, since we're English-speaking people, probably mostly in the United States or Europe. Uh, and, and would expect to be quite similar. We're exactly the same in those same deep ways as people in Africa and people in the Middle East and people in Asia and people uh, from the medieval times uh, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, fifty thousand years ago. We share this deep well of sameness and, and we share it with people 10,000 years from now and 100,000 years from now. And Buddhism is engaged in a project that spans vast, vast stretches of time. Like stretches of time that we can't comprehend. So consciously, I don't understand uh, how I am speaking now to somebody 10,000 years from now. But I believe that's true. Even if all of my words, even if everything I say and every image of me and every mention of Brad Warner disappears in 10,000 years, what I'm saying into the collective abyss that is humanity uh, is, is part of something that is meant to resonate over long, long periods. Uh, this is what uh, transmission means. We are, we're getting it from a teacher who got it from a teacher who got it from a teacher, and it travels this path. Uh, Dharma transmission means that a teacher feels that you are also in sync with that, uh, with that 10,000 or million year long project, and can be relied upon to transmit that correctly. Uh, whether you believe it or not, I don't know. Now, something else I got recently was a, an email from my friend Brian. Brian is a monk at Green Gulch, Green Gulch Farm up in um, the uh, San Francisco area. And, uh, and he wrote me about uh, some of the things he's been thinking about, which are quite uh, interesting. One of the problems that we have in communicating something like this million-year project of Buddhism is that it often sounds like a kind of fatalism or a kind of like, I don't care, everybody's the same attitude. Uh, and it's not quite that. Uh, but I understand why it sounds like that, because it kind of sounds like, oh, you know, everything's just going to go this way and I'm giving in. Uh, you have to understand that everything is going to go the way it goes. And your ability to change how the world is going is limited. It isn't, it isn't absent. It, you, you have some ability, but the ability you have to change things is very, very tiny. Someone asked Nishijima Roshi one time when, during a class if he thought that the zazen we did in in our room here had any greater effect on, on what was going on out there and pointing uh, to the busy um, Tokyo that we were sitting in where everybody's rushing around outside and there's all sorts of billboards and signs and everything going on. Nishijima said, 
Uh, I think there is, but the influence is very small. And so that's what you have to understand. You have an influence, but it's a small influence. And you, and you do what you can, uh, and then you just have to just say, fine. One of our biggest issues right now is what they're calling confirmation bias. And I recently tweeted uh, a tweet uh, that goes, confirmation bias, America's fastest growing industry. Uh, people like things that confirm what they already believe. So they'll go to YouTube videos like this one, uh, other people's YouTube videos, uh, articles on the internet, and surfing the web and whatever, and they're looking, and Facebook too, and they're looking for things that confirm what they already think, because those, those feel good. So you, you, you get a little bit of a good feeling if you hear something that confirms what you already believe to be true. You know, you go, wow, I'm right, because, you know, Jane believes it. The problem with our current situation in uh, the internet is that we can easily hone in on really specific bits of this confirmation bias thing that's going on and really, really live inside a very narrow area. This makes us incredibly sensitive to anything that might deny that or might question that. Uh, you, you, so, so people have these kind of hair triggers like, ah, you, you, you question my belief uh, because they're, they're not used to it. Here's what my friend Brian says about cognitive biases. It's becoming clear to me how hard it is to get to that place of wisdom where you are not giving in to fatalism, but also aren't fighting your cognitive biases, but are, as I said, allowing your understanding of the predicament to humble you. That's really what, to me, is unique to Zen. That it remains explicitly aware of our inability to understand what's really going on, but refuses to give up to fatalism and presents the path to wisdom as engaging with this confusing, frightening situation until you are humbled by it, and have compassion for everyone else who is in the same boat. I think that's really important. We're all in the same boat. We're all born into this world not understanding what the world is, not understanding who we are and why we're here, but understanding that we've got a brief time to try to figure out whatever the hell we can figure out and then die. Uh, this, is a, this is a bleak possibility. So you know you're going to die. Uh, and either you're, and you're going to have to do something with this life. Either get as much pleasure as you can, because you figure that's all that there is to it, uh, and, and then make your exit, or, or else uh, try to do a great thing so that there'll be a monument to you in the future that you won't see because you'll be dead. Uh, various things we try to do to establish ourselves and to, and to make this thing work. So I find it's very useful to have a great deal of compassion for others who are in the same boat as me. To have compassion for, for other confused individuals. And to not say to them, I have the answer, follow me. Because that's bullshit. Uh, but at the same time to take responsibility for what little bit I've been able to figure out. And what I've been able to figure out, this little tiny bit I've been able to figure out, is that a balanced view is worth having. Uh, it makes me less stressed. It makes me better able to help in an immediate situation that needs my help. And it makes me more able to kind of ignore a lot of the noise. Because I've learned to ignore the noise that my own head produces. And if I can learn to ignore, or at least kind of put aside for the moment, the noise that my own head produces, maybe I can learn to put aside the noise that your head produces and that other people's and that Donald Trump's orange head produces, you know? I can learn how to, how to manage these things in a way that maybe contributes. But what I'm trying to contribute to here isn't this kind of short-term four-year project. It is trying to contribute to this million-year project that I believe I am, and that you are, and that we all are, 
a small part of. So I'm trying to align myself with a direction that started historically, probably before Buddha, but uh, he was the distillation of it. For what reason? I don't know. You know, why it happened in India uh, 2,500 years ago and not somewhere else? I don't know. It probably did happen in other places, but maybe it didn't take root there. But it took root in India, and it's been moving outward in the, in the last few thousand years into the rest of the world. And I think it's a good direction. I think it's a, it's a proper direction. It isn't, it isn't a religious direction. It's not revealed scripture. Uh, Buddha could have been wrong about a lot of things. Dogen could have been wrong about a lot of things. There's no idea of holding these, this stuff as precious uh, and infallible the way there is in a religion. But we're trying to use the best of what these people have come up with and, and trying to apply it in our own lives. I'll read to you at the end a little quote that my friend sent me from Uchiyama Roshi. While usually we spend most of our time chasing after money, a good reputation, and happiness, and placing the meaning of our lives in the pursuit of these things, ironically it is within the pursuit of these things that we suffer. We seek happiness because we have fixed on the idea that we are not happy now. While pursuing these goals, we place our present life in contrast to them. In effect, our lives become dependent on these goals, so that there is no way to truly give expression to our lives. In this context, giving expression to our lives means that a violet blooms as a violet and a rose blooms as a rose. However, we are apt to start thinking that despite the fact that we happen to be a violet, we want to bloom as a rose because we think roses are beautiful. By pursuing this sort of foolishness, we go about presuming to be unhappy. Some people who see through this pretentiousness develop an inferiority complex or neurosis without ever opening the flower of their own nature. On hearing that it is only natural for a violet to bloom as a violet and a rose as a rose, some people immediately begin to wonder whether they are a rose or a violet. Since life is always potential, whether you are a violet or a rose simply is not something that is fixed, nor is it necessary to try to figure it out. What is vital here is to give expression to the flower of yourself, the flower of here and now and to allow it to blossom as completely and as naturally as it can in every moment of your life. That flower of yourself, that flower of here and now, is your life. So, thanks very much for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. There is information below on how to donate to my Patreon or Patreon, I'm not sure how you're supposed to say it, page, uh, also my blog and other ways. I support myself through your donations. They're my major means of support and have been for the past five years or so. Although I write books and do get paid for them and I do lectures and I do get paid for those, uh, it's, it's uh, chicken feed. <laughs> uh, the, the real, the real, uh, my real support comes from your donations and I appreciate all of them. Thank you very much.